Hello, Trombone Internet. This is Chris Van Hoff, assistant to the regional manager of the International Trombone Festival. We at the festival, of course, are huge fans of the pod, and we are really excited to invite you to attend this year's 2024 International Trombone Festival at TCU in Fort Worth, Texas. Dave Begnosh is our host. We have the world premiere of a brand new double concerto for trombone and piano with the Fort Worth Symphony. We have the American Brass Quintet. We have late night jazz featuring a Latin jam session. Like everything is happening, all the cats will be there. It's the best hang in the world, and we hope to see you there. You can register for the festival still online at www.internationaltrombonefestival.com, and it's happening the last week of May. So go register. We'll see you in Texas. Welcome to the Trombone Retreat, podcast of the Third Coast Trombone Retreat. Today on the podcast, trombonist, arranger, and producer Dave Nelson joins us. My name is Sebastian Vera, and I'm joined, as always, by Nicholas Robert Schwartz. How's it going, dude? Zippity-zoppity, give him the floppity. Wow, you're just going to hit him with it right off the bat. Mm Mm-hmm, I am. How are you doing, Sebastian? I'm good, I'm good. Summer is starting to come to a close, but, you know, this whole year has kind of felt like summer, so I'm excited to to start teaching again and and get everything going. We had an amazing talk with Dave Nelson. Dave Nelson is a New York trombonist that, you know, maybe if you're outside of New York, there's some people that might not know him, but he's one of those guys that you've probably heard before. Most notably, he's on the most recent Taylor Swift album, which is the number one album in the world by far. On a couple tracks on that, especially he's on the the number one track on that album. And we were joking that that's the reason that put it over the top is that extra layer of trombone. But he, he's played in, God, uh, David Byrne and St. Vincent, Mumford and Sons, The National, Sufjan Stevens, Vampire Weekend, Beirut. He, he's played with so many amazing bands and it was really interesting talking to him about this really unique career path he has. Yeah. And Dave's a good friend, and it was nice to hear his story. Like like has been for a lot of these people we've interviewed, I know them, but I don't know their whole story because we talk about other things, believe it or not, when we have beers together. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. And if you haven't yet, subscribe. If you listen on Apple Podcasts or Google or Spotify, subscribe, and it'll let you know every single time that we post a new episode. Yeah, so just, get your just, life together. Just slap that little subscribe button. Maybe uh, slap. Maybe just a little uh, how's he do's it to the five to the five star reviews. And uh, yeah, we 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 appreciate everyone and enjoy Dave Nelson. so stupid <laughs> that's kind of what this is <laughs> feel free to talk about whatever what's up dude hey man how you doing good dude give us a tour i've never seen your studio man okay wow i got a, dr- I got a drum set over there uh-huh. basically that's it it's like a vaulted ceiling which makes the sound nicer i did a bunch of the wood pan made all that stuff myself and the sound panels and everything nice yeah it's, it's about so- 330 square feet pretty pretty nice I'm very lucky to have it. Where are you again? We live in a town called Accord, pronounced Accord for some reason. And uh, it's about two hours drive north of the city, near near New Paltz. Most people know New Paltz. So you have, you have that nice balance of, you know, being close enough to the city, but being far enough away where you can be around nature and, and not be stressed out all the time. Exactly. I, I like it for that. It seems to be perfect for us. We're fortunate. Well, I don't know how much longer we're going to have, but we have this little like pied terre type sublet situation down in Chinatown or Nolita technically and we've had that ever since we got this place which made it possible so I could go in and if I had a project I could stay there overnight and not have to worry about a a two-hour commute each way you know right right so that's been great although now especially now paying for it for no reason it's like uh and so we're thinking about letting it go but we're in, we're in the same boat man you know we're we're on Michigan and we have I mean we 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 just rent a place in the city and we have paying rent the whole time, and it's just like, yeah. okay, for what? <laughs> yeah. But we love our place, and I'm sure you do too, man. You, that, that your little pied de terre, you know. That's I, I remember you've you've had them. Now it's going on eight, ten years, right? 
Uh, no, well, let's see. We've been, it's about seven years. We've been here for seven years. And like six months after we got this place, that place sort of fell in our lap randomly. Like my wife saw a post on Facebook and we snatched it up sight unseen because we knew it was so, so cheap, such a great deal, amazing location. So we're just like, yeah, we'll, we'll do that for a while. So that's awesome. And now, now with everything going on, I mean, are you doubly happy that you have your own recording set up at home now? Oh my God. So lucky, so thankful, blessed, everything. I mean, I was joking that when we first moved up here, it was a little bit of a, a risky move. And a lot of people were like, how that, how's that going to work? You know, And even myself, I was like, how's that, how am I going to do this? I was joking that we finally, finally now look wise. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. You guys, got, you guys were way ahead of the trend. Way also. ahead. <laughs> Many years ahead. But we're like totally hunkered down. I can work here. I can work remotely and do recordings for people. It's just kind of a perfect setup, so I'm lucky. Was that the plan the whole time when you bought the house? That So basically, for people that don't know and people that haven't seen your Instagram, and you should definitely follow his Instagram if you haven't seen it, you built a a recording studio basically in your backyard from like, was it, you said it was an old shack? It was an old, basically like an old tool shed type situation. Musty, smelly. I went in there and like tore it down to the guts, to the bones. I had pretty good bones. Tore it down and then extended the back wall a little bit to create some more space and just built it back up and did some research on acoustical, like we were talking before, acoustical treating and everything and kind of went down that rabbit hole and just built it up into a a pretty good, you know, semi-pro studio that I can use for my recordings. So. Well, I wish people could see what, we, I mean, even the little <laughs> bit we see behind you, it's what I like is, so those are with the mutes on top of them, those are acoustic panels. Yeah, they're called cylindri- polycylindrical diffusion panels. So those are basically designed, that they're made out of wood and, and lacquer to be a hard surface. So they scatter the, the high frequencies, they scatter wow. the sound so that you have more of a diffuse sound field. And then I have absorbing panels above my head and in the corners, and those absorb the lower frequencies. So basically what you're doing, most rooms tend to, tend to be a little boomy in the low range and don't right. have as much of a high-end character to it. So basically, you want to tilt that EQ, absorb the low end, and reflect the high end. And so that's how you get your better sound. But, I mean, what I like is those, they look great. Is that actually, is that real wood on the outside? or is Yeah, that, uh, it's, the, it, it's totally wood. I made it, I made them myself. I've sort of been into woodworking for a while. That's and, awesome, uh, man. You, you should, uh, you should make a side hustle right now of like doing, <laughs> doing rooms, you know? <laughs> yeah. I actually tried to sell those things on Etsy for a while, but I didn't get any bites. And then after a while, I had second thoughts like, yeah, they actually kind of took me a while to make. So I don't think it would be economically worth it. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have time now. <laughs> That's true. I could do it now. <laughs> is, it, is it one of those things you just learn by doing? I see so many just random projects you're doing, like a homemade tortilla press and all these <laughs> Woodworking? Little, you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've always been, I guess, handy. You'd say I grew up, my dad was pretty handy. I worked around the house. I was comfortable with tools to a degree. But I guess about maybe four years ago now, woodworking was something I was always interested in. I thought maybe I wanted to do later in life. And I just had a moment where I thought, well, now's the time. Well, we moved into the house. And that's what it was. We moved into the house. And there was basically what used to be a wood shop in the basement, which is not 100% ideal, but it's okay. There was some wood desk uh, benches down there and an old vice And I thought, well, now's the time. So I found this great guy on the internet that has like an online uh, woodworking masterclass series. His name is Paul Sellers. And I sort of like signed up for his thing and learned all of his lessons for a couple of years. Once you get the basics, you know, you can run with it. It's like anything else. You start designing your own furniture and building. So I've made bookcases and dressers and tables and all sorts of stuff. It's crazy how much stuff you can learn on the internet. Just like anything you try doing. So you grew up in Georgia, right? Yeah, I grew up in Georgia. I, I hear the accent. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. Some people say they don't hear it, and I'm always like, what are you talking about? Of course it's there. Yeah. I'm from Texas, and people ask me why I don't have more of an accent. So it's, yeah. it's a somewhere problem. But were you growing up like close to the city or outside? No, or? no, no. I grew up in a small town named McCray, McCray Georgia, population of about five or 6,000. Oh. And uh, it was not, wasn't really near anything either. It was like three hours south of Atlanta, two hours west of Savannah, kind of in the middle of the fat part of the state, middle of nowhere. I mean, I, you know, I love it. I say that affectionately, but yeah, we were out in the sticks. 
Your family's still there? Uh, no, my parents have, and my brother have since moved to Atlanta. My brother oh, right. moved to Atlanta. He works in Atlanta in the finance industry, and my, my parents moved there to be closer to him. Oh, right on. So he's the serious profession, and you're, you're the crazy artist. Yeah, he's the smart one. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of, uh, what music did you listen to growing up? Oh, I was lucky, man. I, I did grew up in a musical family. My dad was the band director of the entire school system there. So band director from fifth grade to 12th grade, he did that. And my mom taught elementary school music as well as the, the fourth grade recorder class that you do. Oh, yeah. Um, so we were kind of like the music family of the town, I guess you'd say. But yeah, music in, in the house, always great music playing in the house. A lot of jazz, blues. He was a kind of a blues guitarist, or is, still is a blues guitarist. Played in bands. Was exposed to a lot of different types of music. Later on, a lot of classical music too. Even like concert band music, you know, <laughs> being a band director, I would hear that in the house. A lot of Frank Zappa. Oh, right on. Prog rock type stuff. Yeah. So I had some pretty good influences. Was lucky early on. So it was, it was kind of just kind of obvious when you were getting older that like, okay, I should just do this. Yeah, I never, there was nothing else that I ever felt that I could do. I mean, when I was younger, I was, I was interested in drawing and, and being an artist. And I thought maybe for a minute that I could be an architect or something. Oh, cool. Uh, well, you're an architect now, kind of. I guess, yeah. Sort of, in a way. <laughs> so was it Manhattan School you went to? Or did I make that up? I did. Well, most of my schooling was at the University of Georgia. Oh, right So on. I did my undergrad there, left and moved to Atlanta for a couple of years and freelanced and did a, a variety of other things. That's when I first got into music production too, by the way. But sort of like did some freelancing, driving around, playing in regional orchestras. And that's about the time that I started getting more serious about classical music. Because prior to that, I was just primarily a jazz type player. And then I got an opportunity to go back to UGA for a master's. They had this amazing program, or still do, uh, it's called the Bulldog Brass Society, and it's a brass quintet, and they brought in Fred Mills, I don't know if you remember this, Of course. back in the, I guess, late 90s, they brought in Fred Mills, recently retired from the Canadian Brass, to start this brass quintet program, and it was an amazing experience, working with him, working with the other people. He's a character. Uh, oh, my God, total character. And our, our whole, it was an assistantship thing, so they paid us, you know, modestly to be there. Our only requirements were that we had to rehearse every morning for two hours, and then we had to put on recital once a semester. That's great. Of course, we wow, went above and beyond. Cool. We did a, we put together our own tour of England. We did a lot of fun things. That was a, a really nice experience in my life. So in school, did you have kind of an idea of what you were trying to do when you were when you were studying music did you have an idea of like i want to be a jazz musician i want to be a more of an orchestral guy i mean or did you already kind of have this in mind of of kind of this career that you've created for yourself yeah it's a tough question i don't know i i, I was just sort of following the path of least resistance like we all do like like water does you know i like in my undergrad I studied classically, I guess you could say. I studied with Phil Jameson, the trombone teacher there, which is great, a great experience. But I always joke and say that, in a sense, my real education was playing in, in the music scene downtown. I don't know if you know, but Athens, Georgia, is kind of known for its vibrant music scene. Some famous people came out of there, too, R.E.M., B-52s, but just generally a deep artistic community there. And so I was like busy playing all sorts of ensemble jazz groups, uh, Latin jazz, rock bands, whatever. And, and that's really where I sort of cut my teeth and had some good real world experience. And like I said, it wasn't until after I left undergrad, moved to Atlanta and started playing around that I thought, oh, I kind of like this classical stuff too. I want to learn more about that. So that's when I came back and started getting more serious about that. So it's all just like in the moment, I'm following my interests, you know, and sort of like going down the rabbit hole of this for a while, and then I go down the rabbit hole of that for a while. That's kind of like sums up my whole career, really. <laughs> and that explains the woodworking and everything else, you know, jack of all trades kind of thing. Well, so you went to Manhattan then? After, After my master's. Right, so, yeah. so I was there with Fred Mills and did that whole thing, and the way it worked out was Joe Alessi came down and did a series of concerts, master class. I played for him. He heard me play in a concert. He liked what he heard. And then he started talking to me and, and my teacher said, you know, Dave should really come to New York. And um, prior You're to- like, nah, Joe. I mean, I, I, I never- I got my own stuff going on. I mean, I was flattered. I'd never considered that. And I just thought, 
whoa, that's that's a, an amazing opportunity. I got to follow that and just see what happens. So he helped set it up. So I, I went and auditioned at Juilliard. And it's a funny story. I don't, like I had just finished my master's. So what was I going to do? And we actually never discussed it. So I went in and played the audition. And funny, it was like my best audition of the whole thing. I played at Manhattan School too. And then at the end, he's like, okay, so what, what do you want to put down for your major? And I really hadn't thought. I was kind of put on the spot. And I was like, uh, well, I just finished a master's, so I don't know. No, what do I do? And then he's like, and he's kind of like, well, you got to tell me. And so I was like, uh, I don't know. Uh, what, what is it called after that? The artist diploma? Artist diploma. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. So, so I said that, I, and then uh, obviously that was the death nail. So when, what, when was this, Dave? That was 2005. Dude, I remember Joe told us about this. I didn't oh, really? know you at this point. Okay, so I yeah, want to get your perspective. So, okay, at Juilliard, the problem for brass players with the artist diploma, this is for people listening, yeah. with the artist diploma, it's not like other schools. They accept, let's say they accept 30 people mm -hmm. total. That's it for the whole program. And you're up against pianists and singers and violinists. And so it's right. really rare that a winter brass player gets it because. We just can't, you know, the proficiency that you're going to have on piano, it, it just is yeah. going to be more so than the trombone. Isn't it like a, it, it's like a soloist training ground? It, it pretty much yeah, is. Yeah. So. It's, it's a very difficult program to get into no matter what. Although didn't, didn't yeah, the trombone player get in uh, some years after it, that? or It has happened, yeah. but it, it like Per Brevig was one way back okay, in the day. Yeah. Um, I believe. I believe. I'm pretty sure about that. But um. And then it was like 20 something years until there was another one. And then it was like another yeah. 20 years. You know, it's, it's, it's just pretty rare. A trombone player got in for the artist poem, I think, and then didn't go. Oh, I think that's interesting. The truth. But anyhow, I was still at school there and he told us that he said, man, this guy came in audition. And if he hadn't applied for the artist diploma, <laughs> he would be here. He's so good. <laughs> well, he so helped. I, that was in you. retrospect, I guess I should have said a second master's, but. But you didn't. You 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 didn't know. He this. also they didn't, they didn't help don't advertise me, so it. I don't, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know. I, I honestly didn't know. So I know. I I mean, I didn't know until I was a couple years into school there. Though that's how that worked. But I mean, so. it, it worked out for the best. I was able to go to Manhattan School and study with Steve Norell for that year, which is mm -hmm. great. And then and then Joe, to his credit, uh, really kindly offered me a spot in his uh, what is it? His summer masterclass series in Italy. Oh, oh right, the Alessi, yeah, right. the Alessi oh. seminar in Italy. So I did mm -hmm. that like in 2007 that summer. Pat Herb and I went over there. Uh, <laughs> that, that was an amazing experience. So, I mean, I definitely got to study with him a bit, and it was all good. So you said you hadn't thought about New York. No. It, it's funny because it's talking about all the, all the things that you do and that you like to do. There's very few cities like New York that can offer you the career that you've had. So it, it really is an awesome place that you landed. You know? It really is. Serendipitous. I mean, yeah. yeah, and so that's what we want to get into, you know, just listing some of the people you've played and recorded with, David Byrne, St. Vincent, Mumford & Sons, The National, Sufjan Stevens, Vampire Weekend, Beirut, Yonzi, which I, I particularly hate you about. That's like, Sigur Ross is <laughs> by far my favorite band. I oh, think really? I've seen them live like seven times. Yeah, and yeah, Spoon, they're... Local Natives, also one of my favorite bands. Yeah. So, fighting back all of my jealousy, how did this all start, and did you kind of... You're going to a Manhattan School of Music, which, you know, is very orchestrally focused, mm -hmm. um, also has a good jazz program, but I assume you were in like the orchestral sort of program. Yeah. When did, what kind of sparked this, these opportunities and, and how, did, how did you kind of follow, start following this path? Yeah, I was trying to think through it. And the best I can recall, what happened was I was studying with Steve Norell at Manhattan School and he told me one day, he said, you need to go play for Tom Hutchinson amazing freelancer in the in New York City we all know and so I did that I went over to the behind the Met one day and I guess he was there and played for him and literally like a week later my phone started ringing for gigs it was just like he plugged me in and so there's these certain people that you just have to give all the thanks to they really pay it forward and, and they help you and and Tom Hutchinson was one of those guys for me so played for him and then he the next call the first call I got the first gig I had in New York City was filling in for a tour with this group called the Burning River Brass. Do you know that? Of course. Yeah, yeah they're in uh, Cleveland. Yeah, so that was I guess probably 2007 or something like that. And then on that tour, I met a couple of trumpet players that were key. I met uh, Gareth Flowers and C.J. Camareri. Oh, of course. On that tour, and then those guys 
help plug me in further, particularly in the, in the indie rock world, CJ. I don't know if you guys know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we were in school together. Okay. We always do Easter gigs together. So That's right, yeah. So he was really sort of on the cutting edge of like working with a lot of these these indie rock guys. And and I think he, he heard something in me and, and knew that I had that certain skill set that was able to cross over. I think because I, I like I said before, I played with all these bands. I just had that experience. Was this a particular type of music? Were you already into these bands already? No, I hadn't been like like he called me to come play with Sufjan Stevens, and I did. I wasn't really familiar with his music at the time. This was uh, two thousand nine, two thousand ten. But I knew he was a rising star, and so I was like, "Oh, I got to check that out." And then that sort of opened the door to the whole thing. You know, th- there was this whole scene in Brooklyn with the indie rock, and Sufjan sort of opened that door for me. So I went and did a series of rehearsals with them and did some recordings and. From there, it just sort of grew. I mean, it's fun. It's funny to hear because I mean, obviously, like you know, we've all played gigs gigs together. The three, the three of us in different configurations. Mm-hmm. And for Se- I'll speak for Sebastian here, but for Sebastian and myself, we're we're obviously much more on the classical side of things. Um, Don't cl- pigeonhole me, Nick. Don't class- <laughs> classical new new music. I'll, I'll I'll give ourselves a little wider berth. But so you're. Yeah, I mean, you're. We know, and you know, New Yorkers know that you're definitely working in the scene in that regard as well on top of doing these tours with indie rock bands and you know the things that you're talking about right now so it's i think i think it's amazing that to see the similarities between the two industries of you know that seems so in a lot of ways polar opposite like like an indie rock scene and a classical music scene yeah but the way that we get into the scene is very similar it's kind of it just like slowly starts to snowball and you like one person gives you a gig and you meet someone else. And then, so, I mean, like, I I think it's, it's reassuring for anyone to hear that it really is the same for most people, no matter how you, or what road you go down in the music world. It's it's just like you meet one person, you meet another, you meet another, and then suddenly your book's full. Yeah. It's like that old saying, like 90% of it is just showing up and, and being, and being willing to, and like wanting to do it, you know? having a good sure. attitude. And one of the things that I think really worked for CJ and, and myself and sort of that whole crew is, and Rob Moose, who they started another group with. We should, we should just say who, cause some people might not know. I don't know if we said the CJ and CJ Camareri and Gareth Flowers with trumpet, trumpet, players. I don't trumpet players. Yeah. Yeah. Trumpet players in New York. Which I find for me, like it's usually in my experience, it's the trumpet players that are the go getters and they create the gig opportunities. I don't know. I mean, I guess that's not totally, but just in my experience, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I, ha- I happen to meet these guys like CJ. They're just like really, really go for it. Anyway, so they they reached out to these indie rock guys and said, "Hey, we're you know we're classically trained musicians, and we want to bring to your music the same level of dedication, sophistication that we have been trained to give to classical music." And I think the the indie rock guys really appreciated that because it you know no one was looking down their nose at it. You know, it was it was music, and we all took it seriously. And we enjoyed it. We wanted to be there. And you right. and you saw this whole. I mean, you're right in the middle of this whole trend that started. I don't know when to say exactly, but maybe yeah. early 2000s, where mid 2000s, where you know a lot of bands now are incorporating a string quartet or yeah. you know three horns or you know trombones. adding all these yeah. layers, trombones. I mean, have you have you had to you know, like you say, kind of convince people what the trombone can do in certain situations? Us a little bit, but like you say, a lot of it was timing. There was a certain scene happening in the mid 2000s and early teens where there was sort of a crossover between the contemporary classical music scene in New York, what they call new music, and the indie rock scene. So, in that, that crossover was this fertile ground where you had like really amazing composers like Nico Muley working with Sufjan Stevens and The National doing arrangements and these intricate string arrangements and trombone arrangements and like bringing that classical sensibility and dedication to the craft to the indie rock world. So it it was this amazing kind of moment in time. And I guess it's still somewhat going on, but I don't think quite as much. Really? And I just, it was like a, a perfect timing for me. I just like happened to be there when that thing was going. And I happened to have, I think the right skill set for it, you know, was so the what, other part so- of it. What's something that, you know, say, say someone's listening who is more classically engaged, typically plays in orchestras and 
you know, gets an opportunity like this, what what's something that a typical person wouldn't know about this kind of situation? You you get called by a band to come record. Is there anything different that you kind of weren't expecting or different way you have to look about it or the way they communicate with you that's different? It is different. I'm not sure that I didn't expect it because, like I said, I had had some experience with playing in bands and I knew that it's different in the sense that you go in and very often there won't be charts for you. You know, they'll say, what do you think would sound good in this case? What do you think you could do that would work? And you sort of have to be a little bit of a composer sometimes and bring your artistry to it. You have to be a little bit of an arranger sometimes. Not all the time. I mean, sometimes there are definitely charts, but very often you go in and they'll say, what do you think? (laughs) You know, and you have to be a little bit of an arranger and say, well, uh, I hear in the song that there's a hole here and then maybe I could put something there specifically in this frequency range because there's a hole right there and you just become an arranger that way and you can offer your services that way. You, you provide them with something that maybe they couldn't have done on their own and you become valuable, I guess, in that sense. As opposed, awesome. to, as opposed to going in and expecting them to just give you a written sheet of music you got to be bringing something to the table too, sometimes. You know. I, I don't so know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious. No, that's really no, that's great. Yeah. That's great, and I'm kind of curious. And you don't have to get into super specifics, but you know, a lot of people don't know how this kind of side of the business works. And it, nowadays, is if say you get called by a very you know famous band to record on an album, is it kind of a every contract's different kind of thing or are royalties still a thing? Is it more of kind of a flat fee kind of thing? Is it, I imagine the, the best way is to be able to tour with the band as far as just making money. Yeah, I think in general, touring is, is where it's at now because people don't make as money as much money from record sales, obviously. <laughs> so there's been a shift. <laughs> it used to be you would tour, I guess in the old days, <laughs> which I wasn't really part of, but I guess you would tour to sell the record. And now right. it's like you make a record so that you can tour kind of thing. Wow. Um, That's, it's an interesting, it's, it's an interesting truth. I don't, I don't even want to say a viewpoint is an absolute truth. Yeah. It's crazy. And I'm certainly not an expert, but I guess to answer your question, all of it exists. I have done uh, sessions that were still union contracts and you get every year, you get the residuals from that and that's great. But I think those are fewer and f- further between. Uh, usually it's more of a, just a kind of a flat fee type thing. Right. Did you see what the Spotify CEO said this week that like got a lot of news? Uh, no, I, I heard something about it, but I didn't. Basically, he's just complaining that, you know, all the musicians that are complaining, he says they just need to, to write more and not put out something every three years. They just need to make it part of their work and record more. And that's, that's why they're not making as much money. Yeah, he said, he said it's, uh, you, you can't expect to create an album every three or four years oh, really? and live off of that. Huh. You gotta feed just feed, like, feed my beast. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. While he gives you like point oh 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 one percent of every yeah stream. yeah that's interesting. And then uh, was it what what band created the silent album? Was that was that Wolfpack who did that? Oh gosh, um, I don't know. And what they were trying to game the system, and they were asking all their fans to just play the song the the whole album of on silence while they slept. Yeah, it's total silence. <laughs> And so that they could game the system and they actually like started getting some decent checks from Spotify because they got millions oh, really? and millions of plays and then Spotify like shut it down being like, Oh, you can't do that. And it's like, well, why can't I? Well, wait, that's <laughs> not fair. I mean, John Cage proved that, you know, I guess he was the, oh, he, that's true. He was the original silence yeah. guy. So yeah, it's uh, musicians are always going to come out behind on, on all this. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. I want to hear I want to hear some stories from working with some of these bands like some some tour stories or something like that. Give us some give us some stories from in the trenches, man. Come on. Oh gosh. I wish I were more interesting than that. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'm the type of guy that just shows up and tries to do the job, keep your head down. I'm that type of guy. So, I mean, yeah, there are fun times for sure. I remember um one of my favorite things about the David Byrne tour, for example, was I don't know if you know, but he's an avid biker. You'll often see him biking around New York City, which is kind of interesting. And, and he advocated for a lot of the bike little stations around town. I guess before they put up this, the city bike thing, he would have his sort of artistic, creative little bike things to uh, attach the bike to. What's, what are those called? 
by lock cracks. stations or something. Oh, uh, by, by cracks or something. Yeah. So anyway, he uh, we did this world tour for that lasted eighteen months, and he had a, a relationship with a folding bike company, and so they hooked us all up with these folding bikes that would fit underneath the tour bus, and it was one of my favorite things about the tour. We just we roll into a new town. And we'd all kind of disperse like spiders, like exploring <laughs> the town. And it's just amazing what that can do for you. It gives you that certain freedom where you're not just on your foot and you're like, okay, I'm on the tour bus. Now I go on the venue. And then later we go to the hotel and that's pretty much it. I walk out to go find coffee and that's it. Yeah. And now you have this bike and there was so much exploring going on. So that was, that was fun. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. So what would you say? I mean, I'm just curious just because this is such a foreign world to me. What would you say was your favorite? I mean, maybe it's hard to say this because you said, like you said, you're the type of person that just puts your head down and does a job. Yeah. What was your favorite group to play with artistically or hang wise or a mixture of the both? Yeah, it's a tough call. I mean, I enjoy everything I do. I, I would say probably the David Burns St. Vincent project was. That was just a, a blast and a, and a great time in my career um, to work with those people. I mean, David Byrne, just one of those quintessential, amazing New York artists, you know. Yeah, and, it, and he's been doing it now for 40 years. Oh, my God. Longer. Just just legendary. And to be able yeah. to work with him, and it was so inspiring to see him every day. And and that, that was when I learned firsthand that an organization – it really is a top down thing. Like he set the tone for that and it was a beautiful tone. And and the, mm -hmm. everyone that below him, the crew, the band, it infected everyone. It was this beautiful experience. And like we'd roll into a new city and we we'd do sound check on the stage and then at the end he'd say, Okay, I set up a, a tour of this museum today and we're all gonna go check that out and like ride our bikes over there. And he was just like really, really fun and inspiring. And also his work ethic was very in inspirational to me. Go down for breakfast in the morning. He'd be the first person down there writing, blogging about what happened the day before, working on two, three, four, five other projects to be happening in the future. Just blew my mind, his, his work ethic. Have you read that book he wrote about the whole music industry? I've been wanting to read that. Yeah. What is it called? How Music Works. How Music great, Works. Great, great book. Highly recommended. Yeah. yeah. Mm, I'll have so, to check it out. So where, what would you say is the biggest audience you've ever played for? Oh, probably some of these big festivals in Europe, like playing with the National, you know, they would be these big open ground festivals. And, you know, not everyone's there to see your particular band, but there could be 60,000 people in front of you. So describe what, I mean, you know, the average musician does not get to experience something like this. What, what, what is it like walking out and seeing that many people, that amount of energy coming at you? Oh my God. It's indescribable. It's a total thrill. It's like, in in a way, when the crowd is that big, it almost becomes abstract, and you can. It's mm. sort of almost weirdly more relaxing, in a weird way, because you go up this so big, you can't really identify with something that big, you know. Whereas if you're playing for ten or to fifty people or something, you have you make eye contact, and it's I don't know that can be more stressful for me, but just yeah, that the pure. It's like going to the ocean. The energy of that ocean is just so massive and awe-inspiring it's just it's a similar type of vibe and then the and that sound system is loud you know so you start playing and it's just like you feel it in your body your your whole chest and bowels are vibrating and <laughs> the crowd is going wild and you're playing you're like playing as loud as you can i don't know it's really really exciting i mean how do you do you feel completely exhausted after something like that is there like a crash involved or are you kind of like super hyped it's afterwards like and you can't hi sleep yeah, like a hype kind of thing <laughs> it makes sense why there's so much drugs in, in like yeah the alcohol the music industry the alcohol counters that a little bit yeah right yeah because <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I read this article about it it makes total sense and you even see it in classical music it, the you have so many like chemicals firing in your brain with so much stimulus happening that to just like finish that and just immediately stop doing it all right is is very difficult it is but yeah. you, you either some people do it maybe the wrong way where you just <laughs> kind of try to make it keep going higher mm -hmm. um with certain things or just try to sustain it or you know i always loved reading about the bgs for example they were interviewing them because they they were just famously consistent like they never had any major issues they they toured together forever and they were interviewing the guy and they're like 
so what what was your secret like okay. how come like you guys were so without scandal and he's like you know what the concert was our party and after the concert we went home went to sleep yeah right <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, there always has to be some, even some small kind of hang afterwards, you know? Even in the classical world. I mean, after a concert, you know, you, you guys know, go to a bar sure. and have a couple beers, and then then you're calm and you can go home. So <laughs> you have to have that wind down period. I mean, was it kind of a thing where, like, celebrities would try to come backstage all the time um, to see you, of course? And no. Then... <laughs> Yeah, I just had to bat them away like flies. Yeah, um, guys. Yeah, well, no. To get backstage, you have to have a certain pass. So, like after after the show, there would be, I guess what they would I forget what they call it, an after show hang or whatever. And if you had the right badge, you they would let you back, you know. But that would only be like good friends of right. of David Byrne, for example, or anyone that was on our guest list. We would be able to bring them back too. So it was controlled, tightly controlled in that way. It's not like it's not like the Wayne's World scene where you just go back and like Heather Locklear is hanging out. And... <laughs> but then when we'd leave the venue, there'd be a big crowd outside hoping to get autographs, and we would just like, drive through them. And but but that but he he was good about doing some of that stuff too, for sure. My favorite thing is like if you play play a gig with some famous person. And you walk outside the stage door, and the second the door opens, all these people get really excited. Yeah, and they see you, and they're like, "Oh, it's such a such a player." Yeah, it's like, "Oh, it's the trombone player." The weirdest (laughs) were the ones that would hang around the hotel. They would like find out where we were staying. Oh, whoa! Yeah, that was that was another level. But he security is pretty strong. Yeah, but he he was great. Another thing great about him that I really really respect is he promoted all of our individual projects on stage so he would announce really? yeah every show he would announce us by name and he would say rachel dremen has a project a horn quartet gang is barbie and and we would he would let us sell our records out in the lobby no uh, kidding. you know he went down the line and everyone had a project you know that they were able to sell in the lobby and i don't know that we sold a lot of copies but i mean they weren't there to see us but i thought that was really nice of him that is cool yeah very very cool yeah Let's talk about Taylor Swift a little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when did you find out about this? I, I read that I read that you didn't even know who you were recording for when you recorded it because it was so secret. That's true. I'm trying to remember. I think it was in April. Aaron Dessner, who's the producer, he's guitarist in The National. That's, that's my connection there. He got called by Taylor Swift to, to help produce his record, which was just must have been mind-blowing for him. And his manager called me and said, hey, we got this project. We want you to be involved. But the weird thing is we can't talk about who it is. I can only tell you it's a global superstar. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's kind of funny thing to get called for. I was like, yeah, I mean, definitely I want to do that. I have no idea, you know, but that sounds cool. And so they sent me the tracks and these were written out. These were specific orchestrations done by Bryce Dessner, Aaron's brother. Mm -hmm. Beautiful composer arranger and so they sent me the parts to my studio i laid down the tracks and sent it back over and that was that and then i didn't hear anything for several weeks all the protests happened and i thought oh uh, it's a different world now i wonder if maybe they shelved that project i mean Mm, i I really had no idea i was just speculating and then like the day it dropped, I saw, I found out about it just like everyone else. I saw, no way. Yeah, I saw Aaron post about it on Instagram. I was like, whoa, okay. Taylor Swift. Did you have any, did you have any idea, like when you were recording it, were, was your mind trying to guess what this sounded like? Yeah, of course. I mean, like? if you're, if anyone's familiar with uh, the national style, it's a sort of an atmospheric, um, moody. They're known, the national is known for that style. It is, and it sounded very much, in keeping with Aaron's production style. And so I thought, and, and one of the working titles for the song was Reykjavik. Mm. And so my brain went first to Bjork. Bjork. Yeah. I but, knew but it. then I thought, <laughs> which it totally could have been Bjork. But then I thought, well, would you describe her as a global star? I mean, yeah, she is world famous, but I don't know if you would necessarily use that term. And then I thought, I don't know. Not, not now at least. Yeah. She's kind of, and then I thought, well, Tom York, uh, Michael Stipe, I don't know. None of these people have, and then I thought maybe Adele, possibly, if she wanted to do something different. But it never occurred to me that it would be Taylor Swift for some reason. And the, and the, as far as the process goes, so they send you the music. Mm-hmm. And is it, 
like a collaborative thing while you're doing it? Or is it just like you lay it down, you send it off, and then they like send back comments? Or how, Yeah, how, no, how, the, how, these how, were strict parts that Bryce had written. And nothing complicated. I mean, it's really just, you know, I'm playing a supportive role blending into the background oil painting type textures of these things. It wasn't that difficult. And so I just laid down a few passes and emailed it to him. And that was it. Done. Yeah. I mean, how co- I, I, I just have to say, how cool is it that you can be in a situation and realistically think, hmm, did I just record a track for Adele or Tom York? <laughs> I know, it's really... <laughs> or Bjork. I mean, it, that's to, and, and you're not wrong in thinking that way because right. you do live in that world. It's, I think it's just, it's awesome. Right. That, that is an interesting, maybe that'll be a good story later on. <laughs> that is true. Next time someone asks you, that's your story, <laughs> that's man. That's my story. It's not a tour story, yeah. but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pandemic story. That's true. <laughs> Does it ever seem like strange that, so your your interaction was with basically a producer, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, they put together this whole album that's, like, incredibly meaningful to the artist and how you can, like, never have, like, direct contact with the artist. Yeah. But you're such an important part of what's going on. Well, I don't know how important it was. You know, <laughs> just part of the backing track. But But, yeah, definitely very cool. I'm so honored to be that they included me in that. I mean, uh, yeah, and... And Taylor Swift would would have no business talking to me anyway. That's <laughs> I'm one of many. You need to talk to the Trumbull. Yeah, player. I'm one of many people that are contributing contributing to that orchestration that Bryce did. So, you know, it's a pecking order, and we all did our job, and it came together. How many instrumentalists are on it? Like non. Uh, let's see. I don't know. Maybe ten, twelve, something like that. A few string players, trombone. Kyle Resnick, do you guys know Kyle Resnick, the trumpet sure. player? Yeah. yeah, so he played on there. Again, another another trumpet player. Your trumpet players are just uh, <laughs> yeah. swimming with trumpet Again, players. Again, with the trumpet players. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to talk about briefly, and and first of all, that it's gonna be it's like one of those things where talking about the albums, like so. You have two daughters. That, yes, another that? daughter just born uh, three weeks ago. Oh my god! So, oh my god! We're in the thick of it. Yeah. Julian Light, right? That's mm-hmm. one of those beautiful names. Light, what a beautiful middle name. Well, that's my oh, that's they're... my wife's uh, original name. Oh wow. Okay, cool. Yeah, and they're gonna think dad is so cool in a few years when they grow up and see that you were on that recording. Possibly. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <Definitely>. TBD. <laughs> Hope so. So you have you have a few of your own groups. So let me see if I get get all this right. So first of all, you do a lot of solo stuff with with looping, which is super cool. Electronic. Yeah. Um, people can check out your website for pretty much everything dnellmusic.com uh that was my uh, some guys gave me that nickname in college dnell so just sort of stuck all Very right creative. there it is that's what i'm calling you next <laughs> time i see you in person so we have we have the we, you do cool solo stuff you have uh, a group called nelson Patton, which is a duo yeah that grew that grew out of the solo thing so the solo thing is like a story behind that is my mother-in-law one year gave me a loop pedal for christmas and i mm-hmm. thought what is this? I don't know what to do with this. And it literally sat in a closet for about a year until finally I sort of caught up to the idea and I pulled it out and just like experimented with, with it, recording myself. And it was kind of an eye-opening experience. I, my, my, what I call like my unique compositional voice began to ca- come out in a weird way. I, I can't explain it, but it opened up creative pathways in my brain. And so I just like kept going with that and made a couple of records. And then a friend of mine, an old friend from college heard it and he's a drummer, bass player. And he said, man, I love what you're doing. We should collaborate. And so that expanded into the duo. So we've been doing that ever since. And that's called Nelson Patton. Nelson Patton. That's just our last names. Um, most, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, creative. Most, most recently with that project, our crowning achievement is that we have become basically the backing band for another artist named Lonnie Holly. And with Lonnie, we've made a couple records. One of them was pretty critically acclaimed last year named Myth, M-I-T-H. So check that out. Made all the, like several end of the year lists. We made a, a long form music video that was premiered at Sundance Film Festival cool. for that. And we toured all over the world, Europe, Australia. And what's crazy about this project is it's 100% improvised. All three of us, wow. even the lyrics. He, he has no idea what he's going to be singing about. We go on stage, none of us know what's going to happen, and for the next hour, hour and a half, we just sort of lose ourselves in this sound world, 
And uh, it's even weird to talk about. Like, you know, even in the jazz world, like, at least you'd have tunes. <laughs> that, you know, you might improvise, but you'd Dep- have... Depending on how far... You'd have tunes with. that you play on. Like, we just make it all up 100% from beginning to end. And it's a great experience. So Nelson Patton with Lonnie Holly is that project. Whoa. Very cool. I got to check that out, yeah. man. That's kind of... It, it's got a vibe of Keith Jarrett. There you go, Keith Jarrett. Keith. It's very, yeah. it's very Keith Jarrett. Well, I don't know no, if we're it's... on that level, but yeah, same, <laughs> same idea, I guess. Yeah. Do you yell at the audience if, if they make <laughs> any sounds or <laughs> walk off stage? So you got Nelson Patton and then this other trio with a member of the national called Farmers or Puff Farmers? Farmers with a P, P-F, Farmers. Yeah, that uh, was billed as a quasi, they called it a super group, although I don't know that I fit that, but this guy, uh, Brian Devendorf is a drummer in the national. And another guy, Danny Syme, who was the drummer and singer of Manamana, indie rock band. Do, 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And then me, which is weird, but I was honored, obviously, to be in the midst with those guys. And we made two records, much of which I recorded here, my, my parts, at least. And that, that project is super fun, very creative, very kind of um, obviously left of center, but yeah, really creative stuff. That's an enjoyable project. I was hoping we could do a third record, but uh, hey, this time, time. times move on and everyone's had kids and it's got, gotten more difficult, but hopefully. So how, how important is it to have your own stuff and have your own creative outlets in addition to all this other stuff you do collaborating? It's very important. I mean, I've always liked to think of myself a little bit in terms of like an artist composer, even though I hate using that term because it's kind of loaded. I didn't, I didn't study composition. I'm, I'm not a real composer, but you have to be, especially in today's world, you have to be a little bit of your own artist, You're a little bit of a composer. At least that's my mindset. And so I enjoy doing these things. I'm also really interested in, in production and mixing and engineering and that whole world. So all of it together is enjoyable for me. And I like to see what I can come up with as a composer and just see and, and like try to get better at the craft of producing. So a lot of what I make is not, you know, groundbreaking by any means, but it's fun for me. And it's also important to keep putting stuff out there and just stay active as an artist, I think. Sure, yeah, and, you, and you've been doing more and more composing, producing, like you, I was reading, you were doing some stuff for HBO. and Yeah, over uh, the years I have done, Bear I have done some stuff for television. A little bit less recently, but that, so earlier in my career, I, I, I hooked up with a television composer that had been doing it for many years, and I did like a little short assistantship with him, and then we started working on projects together. So through him, I was able to get some TV credits with my name on, you know, on the thing. We did like a, some stuff for SNL, little underscoring tracks, a little thing for Colbert Report. I did uh, a theme song for like a Martha Stewart show. We, you know, wow. random things like that, but that it, it sort of cut my teeth in the production world and taught me a lot. And then I, I thought at one point I wanted to get into more like film scoring and I went to some seminars and tried to do that. But at the end of the day, it was like, I sort of got a little uh, disenchanted with the idea of the feel alike. So in the industry, they'll send you a song and they'll say, can you do something that feels like this, you know, cause we can't afford it or whatever. And so you end up doing a lot of that for TV, commercial work. It's like, do something that feels like, sounds like Rolling Stones, but, you know, we won't have to pay for it. <laughs> Isn't going to get me sued. And even in the film scoring world, do something that sounds like, you know, whatever, this other film. And I sort of became a little bit disenchanted with that and thought, no, nah, I want to try to explore my own voice, whatever that means. And then that's when I sort of discovered the loop pedal. And then it led me, it led me down that whole path. That's super cool. Yeah, man. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I just, I think it's amazing that um, it seems like you, you kind of just brush off these little things that, that you've done. And it's like, those could have been whole careers if you flushed out the, the path, you know, if you kept walking down a path to either, you know, film scoring or TV jingles or whatever, you know, you could have gone down that path or right. you could have gone down the playing clubs in the South path. If you, if you had just stayed down there, yeah. you know, there's so many things you could have done. Well, that's what I mean. I've done it there's all. There's a certain characteristic you know? about me. I guess maybe I get bored easily and I just have a lot of, I don't know, maybe an ADD sort of element. I'm interested in a lot of different things. And 
the good that, that's a both good and bad because it means that you're wide, you're spread, but you're also not very deep in any one of them. So <laughs> that's the the internal tension. But it seems like you're not afraid to learn either. I mean, it, it, going through school, you know, getting a typical performance major in a university, it's not necessarily preparing you for all the different things you've done. Right. Um, and you haven't been afraid to be like, oh, I don't know how to do that yet. I'm just going to call someone up that does know how and learn. Yeah. You have to have a little bit of that DIY spirit, I think. I agree. I agree. Hashtag DIY spirit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that should be your uh, Twitter handle. Yeah. Maybe it should be. <laughs> with, a, with a Y spirit. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I, think we, I think we scratched the surface on anything, yeah. everything, and I think... <laughs> I'm good. I, I just yeah. want to say I, I really appreciate you guys, you guys having me on here and... Also, I really admire what you're doing with this whole thing. I mean, you know, you guys have a real go-getter kind of work ethic thing too, which is very admirable. We mix it in with extreme laziness. We're we're very bipolar. It really, yeah. It's, it, it there's nowhere in between for either of us. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we got we got to get you to come hang in Michigan sometime and and talk about your unique career path. To, yeah, that'd be you cool. know, because there's you, there's so many young players that just never imagine like they're like oh my god he's doing so many cool things and he's playing with all my favorite bands but like i could never do that or like i wouldn't even know the first thing about how to start doing that and it's it's really just like you said kind of following what you're passionate about following Mm -hmm. the opportunities following what you enjoy yeah and i i think the number one question i get asked as a teacher is you know kind of what 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 next what do i do how do i make this happen yeah and I think, it, like I said, when you were talking about all this, that it, you know, it's not just like there's going to be like one big door open, opens and there's your career. It's like a series of, of smaller doors. And then suddenly you look behind you and you, you have, you know, a hundred different open doors and you have yeah. all these pathways you can go down and, and suddenly you're like, holy crap, it's happened. I'm actually like doing this. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's reassuring to hear someone who's not cut from, or I don't want to say not cut from the same cloth, but certainly not sticking to one style of playing or one type of career and you're you're making it happen at the highest level which is awesome yeah i appreciate that keep it interesting (laughs) no kidding that is interesting well dave thanks so much for uh coming on we really appreciate it good good luck surviving the rest of however long this is gonna be (laughs) you too man this is crazy i can't wait to get out there and play some gigs again i I remember those gigs yeah (laughs) a faint memory What a gentleman! <laughs> yeah, what a, what a good guy, and, and really, I that, that was definitely the most I've ever gotten to talk to him. Incredibly down to earth, especially for the amount of cool stuff he does. He could be, you know, way too cool for the trombone world. You know, be this he is indie way trombonist. Too cool for the trombone role. He really is. Yeah. <laughs> but to be honest, so are you, Sebastian. Hey, you and my mom both agree that that's all I need. <laughs> I'm in good company. So, uh, yeah, I thought it was a great interview. I'm glad we're starting to s- sort of branch out here and experience more interviews with people outside the orchestra world. Not that we're veering away from that. We just want to encompass the entire Tremont world. And he definitely, while at home and comfortable in the classical, quote unquote, classical music world, he uh, lives with many different hats. He has many hats in, on his hat rack. Hat tree, hat tree, hat tree. I've never heard that. That's a, that's an expression. Yes, I have a hat tree in my cottage. That's kind of nice. It's a little more visual. I thought you'd be a hat guy with your um. Wait. Okay, don't even start. <laughs> I have a feeling you're gonna start. <laughs> I was gonna um, start. Yeah, and and we we talked a little bit about it, but man, just seeing pictures of this giant project he had where he he turned this this shed basically into this really badass studio it's really cool check out his instagram he's uh at d nell nelson so d n e l nelson he's he's got one of those instagram accounts that the amount of followers does not reflect how cool it is i I was spending some time before the interview just going through just a lot of beautiful imagery and really cool art videos he's made and then just all his woodworking and the stuff he's done in his studio, it's got to be such a, a nice thing to have. Well, yeah, and he, he mentioned 
kind of offhand about seven different things that he's sort of into like woodworking. And then you see in the background, it's just like the acoustic paneling, which of course uh, our listeners can't see it, but we were on video with him and he has these beautiful acoustic panels and I, I, you'll hear me talk about it. And he says, Oh yeah, I made those. And it's just like, I imagine you go around his house and it's just like, he needs a new cutting board. So he's just going to pull out a chainsaw, little shellac, get it going. A little shellac between mm-hmm. friends. Mm-hmm. I was talking to him a little bit before you popped on in the interview because I, in my own studio at home, I'm, I'm trying, it's, I have a lot of wood and it's just very live. And I just keep ordering more and more and more foam panels and I feel like it's doing nothing. So I just keep ordering them and soon my, all my walls are going to be coated, but he gave me a lot of good ideas and it's just, it's incredible. You know, he just took some acoustics courses and learned a lot about things and watched videos. And that's, you know, that's the way to learn stuff in, in 2020. You don't have to major in something to learn. And he spent a lot of time teaching himself how to do woodworking and, and following these courses. And I think that's cool because that can apply to any skill you have. Because like we were talking about in the interview, you can't go and major in trombone performance for indie rock bands. You know? <laughs> <laughs> watch that be a thing that pops up in like 10 years <laughs> that'd be cool it would be cool um that'd but yeah cool. he he found his way there you know ra- rather innocently i don't think it was like you know he he got onto a bus from georgia with a dollar in his pocket and a song in his heart and showed up in yeah. new york and was like i'm gonna play I'm, I'm gonna play trambone in an indie rock group and it's just no nah, he just kind of Grew out of some relationships, like like everything does in the music business, in my opinion. 99% of work, I think, comes through reputation and connections. So, hey, be, and, nice, and, be nice to each other. How about that? And sound yeah. good at the trombone. What a concept. Mm-hmm. And I think there's some subconscious stuff playing. You know, you kind of just follow your instincts and follow what you like to do. And, and when you have a good feeling about certain people, you know, you're just like, I want to hang out with that person more. I want to say yes to more work with this person and kind of follow those paths. And, you know, he discovered things that he enjoyed and it just fit with his personality. And that's so cool. I, I really liked how he had no idea for that Taylor Swift album. He had no idea who was, he was recording for. He was just laying down tracks. He was told it was some famous person and his mind was kind of racing. Yeah, that's a that was a pretty fun, fun funny part of the interview, hearing him nonchalantly saying well i guess it could be tom york or bjork uh i guess it could be adele if she wants to change up her sound you know it's like, have, have i ever have I ever told you my bjork story you have a bjork story i have a bjork story it was when i was living in new york and i was in this group called guidonian hand it's a trombone quartet we we focused on like new american works with the wonderful players will lang mark Rashinsky, and james rogers and we were together about nine years but we did a lot of like very new music sorts of things in New York. And we got called to play on the soundtrack and then end up acting, quote unquote, acting in this movie, in this Matthew Barney movie, who, who's like, have you heard of, you know, you've heard of Matthew. Barney. Yeah. I, you were here when you got the call. So in Michigan. Oh, right. Okay. So I remember, I remember this happening. You actually remember things. And so basically, if you've never heard of Matthew Barney, he's a very avant-garde director very famous avant-garde director not the type of movies you see in movie theaters back when movie theaters existed but it's basically the opposite of marley and me so we get asked to be in this movie this movie is literally i think eight hours long i've never seen it Uh, it's called river of fundament but basically i was a new york sanitation worker in the movie go figure and I was at his studio getting fitted for my New York sanitation outfit. And long story long, he was partners with Bjork at the time. I think they have like two kids together, something like that. And I just heard all these people giggling and laughing in the corner after I was trying things on. And I, I looked up and he was like on Skype holding up like a iPad, talking to someone. Everyone was gathered around. All the, all the crew was gathered around laughing. So I walked up. And he's talking to Bjork on the screen and she's just shaving the head of their young daughter. She had to be like eight or nine and she was having the time of her life. She thought it was the funniest thing in the world. So I'm just like watching Bjork shave her daughter's head. And it was just one of those New York moments where you're just like, okay. Is that where you got the inspiration for your hairstyling? (laughs) 
<laughs> and if you enjoyed the podcast, please consider leaving us a rating and a review on iTunes with a question or topic you'd like to discuss. If you'd like, and follow us at Trombone Retreat on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and our website, tromboneretreat.com. Also, feel free to shoot us an email at tromboneretreat at gmail.com as we love hearing from you. You can also follow Nick at BassTrombone444 on Instagram and me at js.vera on Instagram and at Sebastian Vera on Twitter. And if you haven't subscribed, please do us the honor of subscribing. And did I, did I segue enough away from that? No, I think you should have leaned into it. <laughs> I kind of leaned out yeah. happily. Well, I think it was a great interview. I had a I had a fun time talking to him. It was nice just catching up. And it's always nice to hear your voice, Sebastian. Oh, what a guy. I know. Well, I guess until next time. Can we, can we both do the, the going away thing? How about one of us does out and one in? Huh. I wonder what that'll sound like. Okay, uh, I'll... What do you want to do? I'll start from, I'll start from away. Okay. One, two, three. Retreat yourself.